All right, hi everybody. Um, like, like I said, so my name is Scott Lutz. I'm a customer facing data scientist with Data Robot. Uh, essentially what we do is we try to provide a platform for our customers to accelerate their ability to deploy and manage um, machine learning models. So to kind of give this a bit of context, my plan here is to uh, start off by giving you a bit of an introduction with Data Robot and how we use our partnership with Data Robot or with Databricks and Spark to essentially provide this platform that's going to essentially build our machine learning model uh, in 10 minutes. So to start off with, I am going to, I've chosen for today uh, a data set that's gonna allow me to predict how long it's gonna take people to, to collect on payment for invoices. So to start things off, I'm gonna simply drag this sample of data here, 10,000 invoices, into my project here. And what happens is data is gonna consume that. And then once this is actually going to the next stage, I'm gonna go and show you a bit more about what we do uh, through some slides. So that by the time I'm finished talking, the model, the project will be built and we can deploy it uh, using Data Robot and then manage it for uh, our production environment. So um, I want to first of all thank you guys for coming. Um, I, we appreciate your ability to learn a bit more about us. If you want to get more after this presentation, we are on the exhibitor floor um, in the main hall, right across from Databricks, right near where the food and drinks are. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to pick what kind of uh, what kind of target I'm looking for for my project here. In this case here, it's the number of days to settle an invoice. And then I'm going to click on this big start button here. But because I want to do this in 10 minutes, I'm going to do the quick mode and click on start. Now, Data Robot is essentially going to replicate the entire end-to-end -end process of what a data scientist would do to build a machine learning project. And so while we wait for that, let me come over here and actually take you through a bit about what we do here at Data Robot. <clears throat> so I did ask at the beginning if anybody had heard of Data Robot. Uh, we were founded in 2012 uh, in Boston, Massachusetts. We have our uh, European headquarters in London. We've now got offices kind of spread all over Europe, so feel free to kind of reach out to us wherever you are. Um, my name is Scott Lutz, and this is just a bit, a bit of an overview of really what I'm going to talk about, which is really how do you kind of bridge the gap of the democratization of machine learning and AI within an organization? Obviously not for our partners, of which there are lots here. Thank you for coming. Uh, and I'm also going to introduce to you a few of the new kind of capabilities we've just launched in the latest version of Data Robot. But just a quick little overview here of really where we have uh, kind of built our partnership with Databricks. So, you know, basically the most, consuming, most time consuming part of building a machine learning project isn't actually the machine learning, it's all of the other aspects around it. Whether that is finding the right data, getting it into the right shape, making sure it passes your governance and, requ and, uh, and compliance requirements. You've got your, obviously building your models in the middle, and then you've got everything else that kind of surrounds it. So obviously, I'm hoping you can tell from that slide with the Databrick logo is what they do, the Data Robot logo is what we do, and there's obviously some, some areas where we work together. So we have um, <clears throat> you know, already kind of extended our ability within the capabilities of Data Robot, especially in the last sort of 12 to 14 months. We've added in extensions to our model compliance, our ability to deploy models centrally, either using our user interface or programmatically using our, um, either our Python-based tools. The ability to monitor your models for performance, for data drift, and for time to, to predict or time to, to run your predictions to make sure that you're aware or your IT department is aware or whoever is relevant to that is aware of any potential degradation in your, uh, in your models. Because the way we like to um, we measure ourselves at Data Robot is by the success of our, our customers and by how many models they have in production. If we have customers with nothing in production, we don't you know, deem ourselves to be successful, and that's how we rate ourselves internally. So the more models our customers have in production, you know, the better we feel that we're doing for our customers and adding value to that value chain. Now, everybody's probably seen, I'm sure for those of you who've been sitting, sitting through these throughout the day, you've probably seen this slide a number of times, which is the number of projects that require machine learning and AI is far outstripping that of the supply of, of um, data scientists. And even the, the people who are the kind of domain knowledge experts at the business analyst level within an organization. So that's really what both us, Databricks, and a number of the other vendors here are trying to kind of bridge that gap. Oops, sorry. Here, I'll let you take that picture and then there you go. So, ooh, that's a, okay, there we go. Skip some of those transitions. So there's a number of different kind of technologies that, that kind of work with this. Uh, Data, Data Robot and Databricks did a joint kind of presentation, which you can find a uh, link to on the Databricks website about four months ago, uh, where I've kind of borrowed some of the slide content from this. But really, it shows that you know the, the gap of, of technology and skills between data scientists, data engineers, you know, is is you know it's it's, it's a different skill set, um, and 
the combination of using data bricks in conjunction with data robot really helps to kind of bring them together and they can use sort of similar similar kind of nomenclature and similar technologies. So that's really what we're trying to help do here, as well as give our customers the ability to kind of scale out their ability to do both data preparation and, and, and data science. So um, there we go, I'm gonna come with that. So this is really kind of the, the kind of the old way of doing machine learning up at the top, lots of different steps, lots of different tools. But with Data Robot, what we've tried to do is build either in, you know, we have a cloud-based system, which you can use. We also have the same, the same basic version, which you can deploy on-premise or in your own hybrid cloud or combinations thereof. And it's, it's designed to be both useful to data scientists to allow them to really accelerate their ability to build projects from start to finish, to build that kind of confidence that we actually know what we're doing at Data Robot. We've got a team of over 400 data scientists based out of Boston and the Ukraine and Germany and France and the UK who are building the product to make it you know, accessible for our customers to build quality, robust machine learning models. So once they've got that confidence in the system, then they can feel comfortable then allowing or, or kind of passing on the capabilities of the, of the platform to other people within the business who don't necessarily have the skill set of which algorithm to choose to build a model, which is going to solve their particular business problem in the most effective way. Because combining with what we do from, from a technology standpoint, we've actually put guardrails in place within the system that allow us to kind of guide users to, you know, from avoid, to allow them to avoid making the mistakes that are most common within data science um, projects, which are things like choosing the wrong features or choosing features that may have not enough values or the values are too, too vast. So we'll automatically exclude those, still giving people the ability to include them if they need, but by default we'll exclude them. Okay, and then next to that, so what the, the latest thing that we've just offered uh, in Data Robot version 5.2, which we launched last week, is our new automated feature engineering. So as you can imagine, Data Robot itself is a clustered system. Uh, if you use our cloud-based instance, there's hundreds of machines that are kind of powering that. So what our new automated feature engineering allows you to do is that we've, we've actually, it's being driven by Spark to essentially allow you to use within our Disney Data Robot our AI catalog, which stores either the data or the metadata of the data sets you want to use for your projects. And then it kind of then stores the kind of essentially the feature engineering steps that you most commonly use so you don't have to do them all the time. So again, it's just another time-saving effort that we've done to allow us to, uh, to help you build projects faster. And this is just a bit of a reference architecture. So for those of you who, you know, it's a, the way we deploy Data Robot in the cloud um, is also is you know fully compatible with Databricks, but if you also want to then bring Data Robot on premise, we can you know work with you on that. My colleague Mohit, who's sitting at, who's on our uh, um, our stand for today and tomorrow, he's part of our field engineering team. He can definitely have some discussions with you on how we can make those two pieces work together. Uh, we've got some good reference customers, some who are here, but I don't actually see them in the crowd, which is oh there they are, hiya. Um, and so yeah, so basically this is just really what. So the last one I want to talk to around really just how you know, we've kind of worked together to really kind of cover the full gamut of from data prep right through to predictions. Uh, and then that's sort of the, the next thing I want to introduce is really machine, which we call ML ops or machine learning operations. Now, what we've tried to do is within Data Robot, we've, we've always tried to have the capacity to allow you to easily and quickly deploy a, a model into production within the Data Robot UI. Which is, really, which is really great, but we also realize that a lot of our customers already have models in production in various different places, very dif different languages. What we want to be able to do is provide the ability for them to manage all of their models in one central dashboard. So that's really what machine learning ops uh, is really all about. So if you've got uh, uh, models that are deployed in separate machines or separate instances, we have the ability to bring data in to monitor for things like data drift, when they're being updated, or again, performance of those models, so that you can have it all in that one central view, which I'll show you here in just a moment. In fact, let me just kind of toggle back over here and see how my model is doing. And oh, it's nearly finished, so we've been so far seven minutes, so that's not too bad. Um, just to kind of give you a quick overview of what that would look like if I come up here to my deployments. I think I have none left, okay. So I've so currently what I've done so far is I've deployed 18, I've built 18 models. That's the wrong screen. Oh, weird. I'm not sure what's going on here with my screen, but that's, hold on a second. Oh, weird, okay. Let me just do this. Sorry about that. Technology is my friend. There we go. Um, 
so yes, currently in the last stages of building my models, I've built 18 models so far. Um, what we do at DataRobot is we have a repository of hundreds of open source models that we, that we can choose from. Depending on your data set and the type of problem that you're looking to solve, we will select by default 30 or 40 different methods by default. Um, and then we will apply a, a default set of industry kind of standard methodologies such as five-fold cross-validation, um, optimized hyperparameter tuning to those, specific, to those specific problems to generate um, a various set of models using this kind of leaderboard methodology. For those of you who have ever used Kaggle or are familiar with Kaggle, same sort of idea from that. We've kind of taken it from them uh, where the best performing models rise to the top depending on your metric that you're using for, um, for optimization. And then what happens is we use this kind of what we call the survival of the fittest. So the model gets to the top. Now, just for the sake of argument, because I'm definitely going to maintain within my 15-minute window here, I... Uh, as soon as this model is done, is done uh, fitting there, I'm going to deploy that model. It's simply a simple fact of clicking on two button, two links, and that model will be deployed. And it will then allow me to monitor that model for, it opens up a REST API so I can start doing live predictions. Um, I can also go, go in, I can look at the kind of various performance metrics of that model. I can assess it and validate it if, to see if it's the model I want to put into production. But because this is a 15 minute demo, I'm going to assume that it's the right one. And uh, there we go, we'll wait for that to finish. This should have been done by now. I thought I had time to write, but obviously not with all the people in here. It's uh, slowing me down. Um, but yeah, like I said at the beginning, how it's, if anybody does want, to have, does want to get any more information, please come by and see us on our booth. We're over right next to the data, Databricks stand. And I'm just gonna to toggle over here to this one here because I don't want to skip out on, basically it's another platform I've done before. So if I want to deploy this model here, you can see here, it's actually badged with this recommended for deployment. Uh, if I scroll down a little bit here, so you can see, see. we also support on um, some of our models the ability to export the model itself. So if you have, uh, you're using DataRobot in the cloud to, to build and train your models, you select the model you want for deployment, you can then export a Java jar file from DataRobot itself and put that directly into Spark, so you can then score your entire Spark infrastructure as well without having to take the data out of Spark. So we'll bring the, we'll bring the model to, to the data as opposed to the other way around. And that's uh, you know, quite common with our, with our customers as well. So we can see here, this is an example here, one that supports scoring code. So I can export that scoring code with, again, just two clicks of, my, of the mouse. So the, the benefit of that is, is whether it's be for something like Spark, or you've got a sensitive system, or you've got, you've got a, uh, a use case where, let, where latency is the most important factor. You've got to have like, as little latency as possible. You just bring the model to the data, and you can do it in, in basically near real time. So I take this model here. I'm going to deploy it by clicking on my predict and say go to deploy model API. I can add that new deployment. Make sure I'm going to use this data robot to track my data drift. So when I start to get a variation outside of my boundaries from, from training on my input features, it will alert me to that, deploy my model. And that basically now opens up that REST API and makes this model available for live scoring. OK, and once that's done, I can click on my deployment area, and I'll now see that model here. I can then get. A, you know, historical view of, uh, of how the model is performing, both from an accuracy, data drift, as well as health. Um, I will see also models, for example, if I come over to this previous example here, where I've got lots of models that are in production, I can go into, for example, this one here, I can see you know, when the model was last updated, who trained the model, uh, what type of algorithm was being used, what my prediction threshold was, so what kind of cutoffs I've set. So all the information I want to know about that. You'll also notice as well is because this is based off of a project, if I want to then refresh the model, retrain the model, I can do that at a later time without having to rebuild the whole entire project. So I can keep all the tuning I've done. I can keep all of the feature engineering I've done inside that single project. So again, it's going to save you lots of time uh, in the future. OK, and so other than that, the last, so we've come back to here. We've now done our deployment. We've got all of our models are built. And again, as I mentioned here, so this is now the one I can see here. It's been labeled with prediction API. I know that that's the model that's now in production. I can then have multiple mo uh, models as well. And like I said, for, for some certain use cases, we cover regression. We cover uh, classification, both multi-class and binary classification. We support time series and out of time validation, anomaly detection, and soon many others. So if you've got those types of products where you feel that some acceleration would help you guys get more value from your data, please come and see us at the, uh, at the stand next to the Databricks stand. So I'm not sure how much time right, we have, some yeah. time for questions. Uh, yeah, we can probably take one or maybe two questions. 
or you can see these guys at the boot. No? Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, we got a question back there. Um, how, do, how does it decide what, uh, what type of model to deploy? So that, that's, that's a good question. So what type of model do we choose? Yeah, so, uh, so based off of the data itself that's been in, uploaded at that particular instance and the type of problem that you're choosing, so we'll automatically detect the problem when you select the target, um, which can be overridden. So anything that I've shown you today that's been automated can also be manually overridden. But if you select a problem that's specifically for, say, regression, it will by default choose a specific optimization metric and anywhere from 30 to 40 different modeling methods to choose from, and it will use all of them. So we always will build multiple models for every project. So in, I guess if you use a standard, like binary classification will typically result in like 80 or 90 different models. Uh, regressions will typically, well, some, because I did quick, we only did 19, but normally it would be sort of 30 to 40, up to some, time series would be hundreds. Okay. Yeah. But if you know what some you definitely wouldn't be applicable, you can manually remove those. So, so, that, so that's a good point. But the, so we, that's, that's where our team of engineers, they only make sure that the ones that are applicable are in the pool to be selected from. So we have a repository which has got hundreds of modeling methods in it. Um, so part, part of what we do really is uh, when you actually click on the model, we define a whole blueprint which includes the feature selection, feature engineering, it includes any sort of um, you know, feature reduction, so whatever is applicable for that data set and that um, target is the kind of the process that gets followed. And that's unique for every single data set, well, every unique data set. Yeah. But Thanks. if you want to see a bit more, I can, I can take it offline, I can show sure. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, we are running a little bit behind time, so please feel free to find Scott at the booth. Yeah, happy to answer any questions or take you through a more kind of uh, bit more in-depth demo if you want that as well. Yeah, thank you, okay. Scott. Thank you.